Oh, um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but let me introduce you, Dr. Berkowitz, ah, first. So. <laughs> no, if you can, uh, wait, I, I was not, I was not added as a translator. I don't have the translator pop up. Irina, for some reason, every time you're logging in, it's not choosing, it's not recognizing your email. I, I log in with the same email that, um, do I have a different email on my phone? Uh, but can you? Yes, I'm adding can you just you make one my second. translator now? Yes. Just one second. Mm -hmm, okay. Okay. Are I'll interpret on? it. Yes. So we're good? Yes, good okay. to go. Very good. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar today. My name is Antonio Harden and I'm the director of the Child Psychiatry Division here at Stanford. Uh, as uh, most of you hopefully know, we've been doing this uh, project for the last uh, eight to nine months. And on a monthly basis at this time, we're having different topics that uh, we have speakers who will present on. Before I make the introduction of Dr. Burquist, I just want to remind people about a few things. We have a long list of webinars that are online and they've been translated to Ukrainian and Russian. So please take advantage of this rich uh, database that we have available on different topics that are related to individuals with autism, but also to typically developing uh, children. The next webinar will be on February 1st, 2023. It will be given by Dr. Lynn Cagle and will focus on improving language in children with autism by teaching initiations. We also have another one scheduled later on. It will be given by Dr. Lawrence Fong at Stanford University. As you are listening to this webinar, it will be great if uh, you can make a mental note about the other topics that you would like to suggest to us and complete the evaluation at the end. Just want to remind you, and I want to thank Irena and Dimitri for doing the translation in Russian and Ukrainian, respectively. And for today, we have Dr. Berquist, who is an adjunct professor here at Stanford University. She was on our faculty for several years and uh, we collaborated in the past and we continue to collaborate uh, to date. Uh, she is uh, a PhD and uh, did work uh, or did training in uh, uh, the behavioral field. And today she will be talking about assessment and treatment of feeding and eating issues in autism. Without further ado, Dr. Berquist. Ah, uh, Vita Yu, hello everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here today uh, to talk to you um, about the assessment and treatment of feeding and eating issues in autism. As Dr. Hardin stated, I'm an adjunct clinical assistant professor here at Stanford uh, School of Medicine. I'm a developmental and behavioral psychologist um, and I've been working with kids and families um, uh, with autism for the past over 20 years. Um, today's agenda is going to really focus on the understanding the feeding and eating issues in autism and how it presents, considerations and assessment before services are provided, approaches and strategies to address these issues, and um, there are a list of resources uh, for you that you can look at later. Um, so feeding any issues in autism, the most common, um, we see this so prominently in autism in terms of these, these issues, the most common is atypical eating behaviors. Um, and the highest set of all of them would be food selectivity. 
Um, so, for example, limited food preferences, hypersensitivity to textures, being very brand specific. Um, other atypical eating behaviors that we see in autism include pica, which is eating non-edible items, pocketing food without swallowing, and me mealtime rituals. So that's like having your, you know, um, food presented in a very particular way, meaning like they can't touch or it has to be in a specific cup or on a specific, specific plate. Otherwise they won't consume their food. Approximately 70% of autistic youth have atypical eating behavior, um, which is extremely high in comparison to other disorders, uh, which is at 13.1% and neurotypical kids who are at 4.8%. Approximately 58% of children with autism eat fewer than 20 different foods, uh, and they're more likely to develop what we call long-term rigidities around the food. And as you can see at the bottom, there's um, a statistic that states, you know, 69% of children were unwilling to try new foods. So having that fear or that resistance to even approaching new foods or trying new foods, um, even if they're extremely similar, can be very challenging for them as well as another 46% having their rituals around their eating habits. We also see comor uh, comorbid eating disorders in autism, the two most prominent ones being um, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is called ARFID, um, and anorexia nervosa. Uh, ARFID, which is um, comorbid in autism uh, between 12.5 uh, and 22.5, 22.5% um, is basically uh, the criteria for it would be failure to meet nutritional needs with one of the associated, so significant weight loss, significant uh, nutritional deficiency, meaning they can't get it all with their food, dependence on internal feeding, um, which would be kind of a GI tube, or uh, nutritional supplements like Pediasure. Um, and they have marked interference with psychosocial functioning meaning like challenges between their families or being able to go out and travel um, and uh, have to bring their food with them. Uh, so we do, I often give kids um, a dual diagnosis of uh, ARFID if that's like a primary issue and it's kind of beyond the scope of what we see in typical uh, picky eating in childhood or uh, for kids on the spectrum. Anorexia nervosa um, is also, you know, I think it's less known um, that it is uh, comorbid as well with autism. I mean, we tend to see this, uh, it kind of presents differently in autism than it does in neurotypical individuals. Um, you still have the same criteria in the sense that they have significant low body weight, intense fear of gaining weight and distorted perception of weight. Um, in a recent study in 2021, um, we saw uh, autism prevalence in um, anorexia nervosa as 16.3%, um, but it's been as, highly, as high uh, as 37% with an average of 22.9%. We tend to see this in, in children that are a little bit older, and based on the research, we're also seeing that many of these children who are diagnosed later with anorexia have some sort of feeding issues early on in childhood. So what kind of help, what, what, why, uh, why do we have this high comorbidity of feeding issues in autism? Um, well, the hypothesis is that, you know, knowing um, it's really related to their core, uh, core issues or core um, symptoms in autism. Specifically, if we look at the, the restricted and repetitive behaviors associated with autism, um, the two main categories, there are four, cate uh, four categories under the RRBs that we have that um, give us a diagnosis of autism. And the two that are most prominently related to this would be that issue of insistent on sameness, inflexibility, adherence to routines or ritualized patterns of verbal or nonverbal behavior. So for example, extreme distress to small changes, like example, like for the example of like using a different uh, spoon or fork or plate, um, like I've had many children who struggle with, like they'll eat their applesauce out of like this small container that they're used to, but the parents want to buy the big size, you know, right? Because the kid eats a lot. And then the kid will reject the thing that's in the bigger size, even though it's the exact same brand, the exact same item. Um, another one that we see in this category is the need to have the same routine or, or the same food every single day. This was added, this example was added when the DSM-5 came out. 
In terms of hyper and hypo reactivity of sensory input, so sensory is really thought to be one of those issues that impacts the child's ability to, um, to eat some of the new foods. As I said earlier, kind of that hypersensitivity to texture. So we also see in the criteria that we have this adverse response to specific sounds or textures or smells, um, and this can contribute to the feeding issues that we see. So considerations when it comes to services, uh, when it comes to feeding, we really need to make sure that we have a multidisciplinary approach because feeding touches so many different areas and we see different areas um, that can impact a child on the spectrum. So we need to be evaluating and collaborating with all the different um, disciplines in order to have a really good comprehensive approach to the feeding services. Uh, so for example, um, the main ones that we'll be talking about are the medical issues, the psychosocial, which is more kind of what I do um, in terms of psycho uh, psychologists and behaviorists. We have the nutritional um, issues that we need to consider. And then we have some moral, oral motor issues that we tend to see with the speech and language and occupational therapy. So in terms of a medical assessment, what we wanna make sure to do is rule out any medical condition that might contribute to feeding issues. As a provider who, um, you know, I think behaviorally, I think, I think psychologically about a child's like emotional state, um, but I always have to make sure that there's no medical reason why these things are happening because I basically would be setting the child up for failure if I didn't make sure that these things were addressed. So things that we want to kind of rule out or maybe um, send a child to a gastroenterologist or a pediatrician for a consult would be things like reflux, severe constipation or regular constipation, which we know is common is on the spectrum, um, early fullness, meaning they're just eating a little bit and getting full really quickly, having consistent, persistent diarrhea, uh, pain with feeding, a poor appetite or poor weight gain or weight loss. In terms of uh, nutrition, um, this is probably, other than the medical, this is probably the most common one I wanna make sure gets addressed, um, is that we really need to make sure the child is getting the proper nutrients, um, especially if they're young and when they're growing, we really need to make sure we're hitting all of those because it really can impact their, a variety of things in terms of their growth, um, in terms of their ability to just function. Um, you know, if we're not eating properly, we're gonna really struggle with learning and engaging. Um, so assessing dietary intake, such as identifying deficiencies or overabundance and what we call mac macro or micronutrients um, and answer questions about current stability on diet. So for example, when we intervene behaviorally um, or psychologically, like these treatments often take some time and we need to make sure that the child is in an immediate uh, state where they kind of need to get extra uh, nutrition. And so that our intervention is just going to continue to improve the child's diet as opposed to be, you know, something that is more urgent. Um, a good example of this idea of um, like overabundance um, or needing to look at the deficiencies is I've had kids that have iron deficiencies. And so, you know, that's something we need to take care of immediately. Um, and same thing with overabundance. I had a child that was taking too many vitamins. Um, the parent thought, you know, oh, well, let's just take two since you're not getting enough nutrition and that actually can be detrimental. So if parents are actually giving their child too many vitamins that can impact you know, different parts of their body um, and how they work. Guidance on target goals for feeding. Um, for me, you know, in terms of understanding what's the appropriate amount of calories for height and weight and age, I have no idea <laughs> what that is. Um, so I really want to turn to the experts and understanding, you know, what, what, what should we be focusing on? So understanding the amount of calories for the child, what's an appropriate kind of target, and then the types of food and the, uh, and the appropriate amount. Uh, supplementation as well in terms of their needs. So again, vitamins and minerals that we need to high, highly prioritize, um, or they actually need a complete supplementation, which would be something like Pediasure or, you know, a toddler formula. Um, and basically you would refer out to what we call a registered dietitian in order to figure out um, what the child needs.
Another um, consideration for services would be an oral motor assessment. We know a lot of kids on the spectrum do struggle with that motor planning in terms of their, their mouth. Um, indications that you would need to refer out to a speech or occupational therapist would be long feeding time, such as like 30 minutes or more, difficulty chewing, difficulty swallowing, food tends to get stuck in the mouth or the palate, difficulty with mixed textured foods, and drooling or pocketing food. Um, so for example, I have uh, had some kids that have had this issue and um, at first, you know, we're thinking is it behavioral because um, they were resisting trying new foods, but lo and behold, the issue was that they really struggled with moving the food around in their mouth. And so once they were able to get that support, um, it really improved the child's ability to um, eat and also try new foods successfully and um, made it a lot easier for them. Uh, finally, we wanna consider a psychological behavioral assessment in terms of feeding. Um, often we will see kids who have anxiety or phobias around food. Um, examples or signs of that would be experienced trauma related to food. So if the child like gagged on something and then immediately stopped eating it or stopped eating a variety of foods, we know that there was a specific trigger that might have led to the more restricted eating. Um, choking um, or vomiting. Uh, I have a lot of kids that have like a very strong gag reflex. And so um, that could be related to anxiety or it could be related to the texture. We just want to make sure we rule that out. The other thing that we want to do is assess mealtime behavior. So this might be what we would call challenging or disruptive behaviors or interfering behaviors um, with a child's meal routine. Um, so for example, like eloping from the eating place or throwing food or um, screaming or yelling or those types of things. Um, so we really wanna assess the family uh, mealtime routines, such as the structure, how often the child is eating, when are they eating, what are they eating at what time, and kind of the environment around it. So like, is there a device that the child is on when they're eating? Are they, um, are they being self, are they self feeding or is the parent feeding them? So we also wanna to try to interview the child if possible to kind of get a sense of what their thoughts are about mealtime. But obviously we definitely wanna interview the parents or the, the caregiver that's really working on these types of um, feeding issues. You can take a detailed history of eating or use an assessment tool. Um, so some of the most common and well-known tools that you can basically, if you Google these um, uh, names, you would be able to find the actual assessments. Um, they would be in English. Um, the, the first one would be the Brief Autism Mealtime Behavior Inventory or the Bambi, the Food Preven Preference Inventory or the FPI. Um, the PICA, ARFID, and Rumination Disorder Interview, or the PARTY. I do believe the PARTY is both in a um, child interview, which is really great because the other ones don't have that, um, and a parent one. So if you're able to interview the child and they're able to understand, um, then I think that would it's definitely important to, to include the child as much as possible. So you'd want to request or refer out for an appointment with a psychologist or a behaviorist. Um, in order to make these assessments. If you don't wanna use the more detailed assessment, I also really like just um, interviewing them and getting a really good sense of what's happening from their own perspective. Um, so for example, how does mealtime normally go, right? I wanna hear it from the parent, how they're feeling, like, are they stressed, which most likely they are, um, but what aspects are they focusing on? Um, so for example, things, questions that we might wanna ask a parent is what does the child eat, right? Um, where do they eat? Do they eat on the couch? Do they eat at the table? Do they eat in their room? Um, what do they use to eat? Do they require a device to eat? Meaning like uh, an iPad or music or video or some sort of distraction. Um, do they self-feed or uh, is the parent feeding them? Do they have any challenging or disruptive or interfering behaviors? Um, one thing you can do if um, you're concerned about um, the parent or the person that's providing the interview or you're just not feeling like a good sense of what's happening, 
it's always helpful to ask for a videotape of meals at home, or if you can observe via telehealth or in person, any of those would be great. I tend to wanna like lean more towards the, the videotape or like the phone video or the telehealth, because as soon as you enter another person in there, the child's behavior might automatically change. So sometimes we want that like where the child is not as aware of what's occurring. A food log is also extremely helpful. Um, have parents take the log of what their child is eating. Sometimes I say it's three days, but usually a kid, um, like I said before, is only eating 20 or less foods. But all of those 20 foods or more, we want to know the exact information on that. Like, do they eat just have a beige diet? Are they only eating one color? Are they excluding certain colors? Um, what brand is it? Do they have trouble when you switch the brand on them? Um, is it textural? Are you only seeing crunchy foods? Are you seeing a, a complete aversion to soft foods? And so we want to kind of get a sense of that. Um, are there particular flavors that the child likes? Oh, you're seeing a lot of like cheesy type of stuff or chocolate or peanut butter or something like that where there's like prominent flavors that you see the child um, that they're intaking. Temperature. I have a lot of kids that can be very particular about like, it's got to be like shade number five, you know, on the toaster. And if it's a shade six or a shade four, like they won't, they will completely reject it, even though it's the same food item. And then the shape. Some kids will really struggle um, with like, maybe you typically give them like a circular waffle and then all of a sudden you're giving them a square one. And that can really throw them off. So we kind of want to, same thing with pasta. Maybe they eat pasta, but they're really consistently only using the macaroni shape and not the spaghetti shape. And so we kind of want to know, are they particular about the shape of their food? Um, another really important thing that we need to find out is what did their child eat before, but does not eat now, specifically things that they really, really loved. So that usually gives you a sense of what they maybe liked originally, because that was maybe the flavors that their body do like. Um, and they just either burnt out on it or they're tired of it, but it would still give us really valuable information. Um, if you can, or if the parent can, we wanna kind of try to identify a hierarchy, meaning like, if possible, what's preferred of the foods that they eat, what's the most preferred to like more neutral. I'm assuming anything they're eating is probably in a, in a, in a positive category, but sometimes you can get a little bit of grayness there where you can say, oh, actually there's these super high preferreds. And then there's these ones that are kind of, you know, they're, they'll take them, but they're just not as, you know, excited about them. And like I said, every detail matters. Like you would be surprised, like the more you, more information you have, the better you can kind of tweak your therapy and change it in order to help the family make some very significant strides. Okay, so the approaches and the strategies. So we just kind of went over all the different uh, multiple disciplines that kind of need to be involved or considered uh, before you actually intervene. So the strategies and approaches uh, will depend on the results of the assessment. So obviously, if any come, anything comes up medical, you're going to have medical interventions. So for example, if a child has extreme constipation, which is really impacting their ability to want to eat food because they're constantly full or having stomach aches or uncomfortable. Um, we really want to address that before we introduce anything new. Um, and sometimes that takes, you know, like a clean out and sometimes that takes medicine like Miralax um, on a regular dose before we go ahead. Um, dietary concerns, obviously introducing of supplementation, removal or reduction of certain foods, and an introduction of new foods, those are the kinds of things that we would be considering in our treatment plan. Um, oral motor delays, so the kinds of things that people might be doing in terms of their intervention um, for this issue would be muscle strengthening, bilateral chewing, tongue exercises, and utensil use. In the behavioral or anxiety related category, which is we're gonna talk a little bit more about for the rest of the the webinar is food chaining, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, or systematic desensitization um, to increase uh, a child's ability to take on new foods or address any of the behavioral issues that we talked about. 
Goals of treatment will be dictated by the approach and the discipline, obviously. Uh, but we just really want to make sure uh, to check in with other providers that are addressing feeding so that approaches don't conflict. Um, an example of this would be uh, often, you know, I will be working on feeding and maybe the child's also seeing an oral motor person, you know, occupational therapy or speech. Sometimes our approach will be okay and they and we won't conflict at all. And sometimes it will be in direct conflict of what we're doing because I'm, I might be coming from a more behavioral approach and they're coming from a more of like um, maybe sensory approach. And so it just might not coincide. So we want to make sure that we don't conflict because then obviously the child will get confused, the parent will get confused. And I think treatment wouldn't really work because our goals are in, are in contrast. So the current approach to feeding issues in the United States um, are the following. So the first is intensive outpatient or day treatment programs. So this would be um, where a child would go somewhere um, to kind of work on weaning off their feeding tube um, or they have extreme feeding challenges where we're really concerned about their ability to thrive. Um, and, and then the other is the medically fragile children where if they're just, deciding not to eat or really not getting the intake they need, we obviously would need to address that um, emergently. Um, ABA services are very common in the United States and often address mealtime related behaviors. So that would again, like be the things that I was talking about of like elopement or screaming, crying or struggling with um, the actual mealtime routine. Um, outpatient therapies, um, which is kind of what I'm going to be talking a little bit more now. And what I do in my practice is parent training and parent mediated intervention to address feeding issues. Um, often outpatient therapies can also work directly with the child and consultation with parents and providers, as well as behavioral based strategies. So for the remainder, I'm gonna talk about parent-mediated intervention to address um, issues related to the feeding um, issues that we, I talked about in the very beginning, those atypical feeding behaviors, specifically like the food selectivity um, and issues that really prevent a child from getting the nutrition that they need, or those kids that are really averse to trying anything new. Um, so parent-mediated interventions, or we call them PMIs, um, using behavioral strategies to improve feeding issues have shown very positive results. Parents are the most stable figure in a child's life and the ones that will be providing the food choices and with them all throughout the day. So obviously it's, it, it makes sense to be treating the, uh, teaching the parents because they're the ones that are with them all the time. Teaching parents helps promote generalization of skills and, it and they've also found that it reduces parenting stress. Because I think even myself as a parent, I think one of the hardest things is when you feel like you can't feed your kid or you're not quite sure to how, how to help them learn how to eat new foods. Some of the short-term goals with PMIs would be teaching parents how to implement the behavioral techniques to address feeding-related goals, meaning that we would want them to meet fidelity, that they could be implementing the treatment just as the clinician would be um, at the level that they're at the level that they're able to do it. Um, we also want to obviously improve children's feeding behaviors, so increasing positive mealtime behaviors, such as flexibility with mealtime routines, um, independence with self-feeding, and mealtime routine. Uh, and then increase the acceptance of novel foods, um, varieties, such as going from very similar foods to dissimilar foods, So, and I'll get more into that later on. And then volume. Obviously, it's great if a child can try a new food, but we also want to have like increased quantity of those novel foods and really the goal to have replacements or in their regular diet. So that's kind of like, in my terms, like a child is really starting to improve when they've begun to eat new foods and the parent can now send more things to school or provide more things at home. Um, so the child is getting more of a uh, variety. Long-term goals of PMI would be adequate nutrition without the need of supplementation. Um, so no longer needing that pediatrician, no longer needing um, 
that extra multivitamin or the iron supplement, um, and they're getting everything from their food. Uh, decreased interference with psychosocial functioning. I think, as you remember at the beginning of the talk, I was saying that in ARFID, that's actually one of the criteria um, for the feeding disorder. And this is the thing I think that really impacts a child, especially a child that has social deficits. Um, we wanna make sure that they're integrated as much as possible and feel like they can go anywhere and do anything and be able to be sufficient on the food. So for example, increase attendance to social events involving food, increase ability to eat at restaurants with peers and family, increasing eating what's available locally when traveling. I have a lot of families that have had to um, bring their food with them because they just didn't think their kid would be able to eat um, or I'm having to write a letter um, for the TSA so that the, the family can bring the nutrition that they need. And then obviously increase eating what the family eats. So partnering with parents, um, there are four main elements of an effective parent-mediated intervention, um, and they are collaborative goal setting. So we want parents to really be involved in what goals that we do set. Obviously, you know, I, I, I just went over what some of those goals would be, uh, but I want parents to be really uh, bought in so that they will be able to be effective and, um, and they're very motivated to do the intervention because it can be really hard. Um, we also want to use systematic instruction such as evidence-based practices, um, such as the behavioral interventions that we're gonna talk about. And then we want parents to practice and we want to be able to give them feedback on their implementation so that we know they're gonna get closer and closer to their ability to be independent with uh, implementing the feeding practices. And then ongoing support and problem solving as needed. If you want some places to go to learn a little bit more generally about PMI and ways to do these kinds of um, effective elements, there is a, a really awesome uh, YouTube video that's called Parent Coaching Through Telehealth. And you can find that one on YouTube. And then there are also these um, modules online called Affirm or Autism Focused Intervention Resources and Modules. And you'd be able to learn some of the behavioral techniques or have a little bit more backgrounds on them um, if you go to that website. So not just do we want to partner with parents, but we also want to partner with kids as much as we can. We really want to have a collaborative approach, just like we want parents to buy in, we want kids to buy in. That's not always possible, especially if a child is very anxious or very rigid and they just don't want to, right? Um, then we do sometimes have to take what we call unilateral steps towards um, making these decisions to move them forward because obviously it might be impacting their health and wellness. But when we can, we really, we really want to include kids in the process. So for example, um, informing them why and how feeding will be approached, discuss their thoughts and feelings about it, try to understand and address their sensory needs, um, take their motivation into consideration. You know, with some of the kids that I work with, I, I try to do it before I intervene, um, not when any demand is being placed. And I just try to let them know why we're doing it and maybe why their parent came and see what their level of understanding is. Um, take them food shopping. So for example, here, letting a child kind of, okay, if we're gonna work on fruits and vegetables, you know, or we're gonna work on meats or something, or just a like little bit of variation, maybe I take them to the store, the market, and see if they wanna pick out um, some different foods to try. Um, we never, ever, ever want to deceive or trick children when we're getting them to try something. I know there's like a lot of stuff out there that, you know, oh, let's, you know, just bake it into something or so they don't know. Um, but in order to actually improve on a child's willingness to try new things and change their own um, perspective and expectation around food, um, we have to not deceive them or trick them. We want them to trust us and we want them to understand what they're eating. And then that's the only way that we're gonna be able to make improvement. We wanna give them as choices as much as possible, pretty much with any child or adult, um, giving choice really helps them because they feel a little bit more in control 
Um, there are very few things that young children can control. Um, and, you know, typically this is where we tend to see issues. Um, the most common ones are obviously sleeping, toileting, and eating. And so that's where we tend to see some of that I want control and you can't make me do X, Y, Z. So the more we give them choices, the more they get bought in. Obviously, we also want to use their special interests whenever possible. So for example, with rewards, I have a kid who's really into cars right now and he wants to watch videos of like, different cars and how they're made. He wants to look up the make and model of cars and um, look at cars outside my office. And so a lot of what we do is like, you know, give him choices and then he gets to like, look at his cars. Um, so these are the behavioral strategies that we're gonna be going over. Um, they're in these three different categories. One is antecedent strategies, and these strategies are meant to prevent challenges and increase success. These are the things that we think about before we intervene, It's kind of like how we set up the situation. And then teaching strategies are what we do to increase skills or positive behaviors, such as modeling, shaping, and chaining. And then we have what we call consequence-based strategies, which is in response to how the child responds or behaves. And the two most prominent ones are contingent reinforcement and extinction. So in terms of uh, antecedent strategies, the first one I'm gonna talk about is manipulating setting events. So that's like a very behavioral term. And what it means is setting events are occurrences that alter the value of the different reinforcers, making them like stronger or weaker. And so we think about different things that we can do to make those things, those reinforcers stronger. So one of the things that we do is we wanna make sure a child hasn't eaten. Like if we're going to um, have them try things for the first time, we wanna make sure a child hasn't eaten for about three to four hours. Um, so the best time to try new foods is around snack time. I tend to tell parents not to do it at mealtime because they then feel a bit more stressed out about um, having their child eat what's on their plate. And I think if we give a certain time like a snack time, it's kind of like, okay, if they don't eat it, that's okay, because then they're going to have dinner and a little bit of, or lunch or something. The other thing about not eating within three to four hours of doing kind of these, what we, what we're going to call food exposures is that it really increases the natural reward. And that natural reward is dopamine. So dopamine is that pleasure hormone that gets released when we, when we eat and when we're hungry, it's like even better. Um, Consolidating eating schedule as well kind of has that same concept is that we have consistent and predictable eating times where the child becomes hungry, they're more motivated, and then they don't get to eat between those scheduled meal times. The other thing that we might want to do is pair highly rewarding items. So if a child has a preferred liquid or food item when working on self-feeding um, or acceptance of dinnerware. So for example, like in this picture, let's say this child is working on using a fork for self-feeding, well, we better make sure that if they're doing something really hard, like learning how to feed themselves for the first time, it better be easy and it better be super rewarding to do. So we definitely don't want to work on a hard skill with a hard food item. That's just like a no-go. So we really want to make sure if this child really loves this cake and they never, never, ever get it, um, but then they're learning how to use do that motion with the preferred um, fork. Or if it's a liquid, um, you know, I have many kids that get stuck on using a bottle and then transitioning to a new cup. We want to make sure that whatever's in that other cup is like highly preferred liquid. Um, we also want to make sure we have a salient reward. Salient just means like super strong and reinforcing like your favorite of your favorite things. And um, it would be an item or activity. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a, a special interest, it could be anything. Like I said, like about the cars, um, but you only, only, only get it for working on these particular issues. Um, it makes it so that like the child actually like wants to work on the feeding issues because they're like, oh, I really want that thing. So let's go, let's go practice. Um, pairing is when you want to make sure foods actually go together. So if you're pairing things that don't go together, it's like it, it's not going to work very well. Um, so like, for example, if you wanted to increase a child's uh, liquid intake, you're going to manipulate that situation by giving the child their favorite salty foods. 
um, over and over again. And that's just going to increase that desire for the liquid. And then they're taking in the new liquid. And again, you get that reward right away. Another antecedent strategy is environmental arrangements. So again, it's like a fancy behavioral term for basically purposefully planning and organizing how an environment is set up. So for example, we wanna reduce distractions. So again, that's kind of like removing the devices and videos because we want the child to be very aware of what they're doing, what's going on. Um, also kids can get really overwhelmed when they like see too much of the non-preferred foods there. So we wanna limit the number and size of the presented items. Usually when I'm doing a new item, new items, I kind of separate them out um, or if they're on a plate, I have them all three out or on like a napkin so the child can see exactly what I'm asking them to do. Um, if a child's working on like um, uh, new novel food items and they also have deficits in feeding themselves, we want to remove that just like in the opposite one of where we're giving like the high preferred food with the fork. We're going to remove the demand around the self-feeding and the parent's going to prepare the bite um, to target those novel food items so that you're not dealt what we call double taxing a child. We just want to be working on that one specific thing we're trying to target. Um, seating arrangements is a really common one that we try to do, especially if a child is running away and we're working on getting them to sit and maybe your goal is just to get them to sit at mealtime and that's all you're working on. You're not kind of addressing anything else. And what we want to do is kind of reduce the likelihood the child would be able to run away easily. So maybe they're, the child's sitting next to a wall and then the parents sitting next to them or maybe two parents are sitting next to them. So it's just harder for them to get out. Another thing that I do is if I'm working on novel food or self-eating and I'm not worried about sitting, then I'm kind of allowing the child to sit wherever they want or roam around or do whatever they want. And I'm not as worried about working on sitting. I'm more concerned about getting them to eat the novel food or getting them to learn how to feed themselves. Um, this one's extremely important for kids um, who have autism is the visual supports. Those supports really help them understand what's expected. Um, so for example, this visual chart shows you, here's the behavior that we're asking a child to do, which is lick the food. And then maybe they're earning tokens or points to get like the bigger reward. And again, let's get, use that example of the kid getting the car videos. Um, the reward would be the car videos. Um, so the action might be something like touch or kiss or lick or put in your mouth. And it's just very clear to the child what we're asking them to do, because a lot of kids are used to that, like, you need to eat it. And when you're trying a new strategy, you want them to be very clear, like, I am not asking you to eat this. I am just asking you to do this. I'm just asking you to touch it or lick it or something like that. And then you want to be really clear about the outcome that's going to happen once they do that behavior. So again, you're not trying to hide or deceive or anything like that. Try to be very clear as to what you expect, what they have to do in order to get the reward that they want. Another antecedent strategy would be a token economy. I mean, we're all on a token economy. It's called money. Um, but a way to kind of do that for kids is earning a set amount of tokens or points to gain access to a bigger reinforcer. Older kids, I might use like minutes on the iPad or something like that. For younger kids, it might be just the direct reinforcer. Um, it increases a child's motivation to earn tokens and points along the way. And it's a great way to kind of fade out um, the reinforcers altogether because we don't want to get on a token economy forever. We really don't want that. We want the, the food to be naturally reinforcing. And so eventually we kind of fade it out and the food itself is the reward and no longer that external reward. Um, and so it's also good for kind of increasing the quantity that the child has to eat. So, you know, instead of one bite, now you have to eat two bites before you get that reward. Another antecedent strategy that I kind of already talked about is choice making. Um, I can't stress this one enough. We have to give the child as much control whenever possible. So again, like I said, like where they sit, what reward they want. Another one that I do um, is giving them a choice between non-preferred foods. So the parent's kind of like picking the choice of the food items, um, but the child gets to pick from the non-preferred and just that choice will actually increase their desire to eat that other food. It's also really telling, like a lot of times I've been wrong about what I thought the kid was gonna pick. And so it gives a lot of information to me about like, oh, that's interesting. It's not what I thought they would pick. And then they'll keep picking like that one. And so 
um, it gives me more information too about um, how they're making their decision. Again, I kind of already said this, which is when um, they're food shopping. Forced choices, kind of what I just said, is the parent gets to present the choices or the boundaries um, for the eating. Like you can use this cup or this cup, or you can use, you can eat, lick this or touch this. Um, you can have the car videos or the, um, or the video on the, the animals. So we want to kind of, again, kind of set those boundaries. So obviously the parent gets to make that decision. I, as a clinician, like, don't make that decision. I say, like, what are you willing to kind of provide? And it's really up to them. Um, increasing motivation and it, it increases child's motivation and it reduces those power struggles that we see. Another antecedent strategy is task interspersal and task interspersal, again, is just kind of like a fancy word for like going back and forth between different kinds of demands or different kinds of tasks. In the sense of like feeding and how I use it is that we go in back and forth between what we call easy and hard demands. So easy demands are items um, the child has already mastered or ones that would be very easy given past success. So for example, a child um, might like chocolate. And so if I introduce a new chocolate, it's gonna be pretty easier for them, right? Um, if I was working on cell feeding, I'd use a spoon, like an easy task would be using a spoon with an easy to scoop item. So like, for example, cereal or anything that's really easy to scoop. A hard or what we call a stretch food would be a what a child is actually working on. So obviously things like a harder uh, version of like their chocolate situation, like chocolate hummus or, you know, something like that or chocolate spread. Um, or even something even harder like meat or vegetables or things like that. Um, using a spoon with a harder to scoop item. So as the child kind of improves with the scooping, we want to be also stretching them. And so we would want to use harder things like rice or soup or things like that that are easier to spill and they get, you know, maybe don't like when it gets struck. It really, by going back and forth between the two, meaning like maybe I'll present an easy demand and then I'll present a hard, a hard demand and and then I'll go back to an easy one. I'm trying to build a child's momentum and self-confidence. And it really helps the child um, prevent from giving up. I actually even had like a kid who would be like, that's too hard. I want an easy one now. <laughs> and that just reminds me like, oh yeah, I, I pushed too hard. So I'm going to listen to him and I am going to give him an easy one, but then I'm going to go back to, to a harder one. Um, but again, you're setting up. They don't get to choose. You're the one that's choosing those hard ones. So you have to really pay attention because what we perceive it as easy might not be so easy. So you have to watch those nonverbal and verbal cues or just be more aware of what's hard for them. Um, another way to do it, which I love, 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 is using a visual rating scale that a child's perspective. So this is coming back to like using a child's restricted interest or special interest and involving in the process. I have a kid who made up their own like chocolate scale, which is used for his emotions, but he also uses it to rate his food. So he'll be able to say like, oh, that was like strawberry cream. And strawberry cream is, as you can see, is you know, maybe not so great, super upset. Oh, I don't like that. Um, and, uh, and then what's really cool is if you use this rating scale and the child starts to eat the food and they continue to rate it, and then he's like, actually, it's a plain chocolate, is that you can see the child themselves can see, oh, like after I've tried it many times, like it's not as bad as I thought it was. And maybe I still don't like it, but I could handle it. I could do it. And it's kind of like a fun way to have a child be able to be involved in telling you how they feel about things. Um, so I really like it because if a child says it's strawberry cream and their face looked like it was totally fine, um, I need to kind of think about that. Um, also with kids who have autism, they tend to be very extremists. So we get a lot of strawberry cream and orange cream versus kind of these middle ones. And so it also helps a child get a little bit better at understanding that it's not really an all or nothing, that there is some gray there and that they can see that progression over time. So now we're gonna move on to teaching strategies. Um, so one is modeling. So demonstrating to the child the desired behavior that we're asking them to do, such as like licking or touching. 
Um, you want to verbally and physically walk them through what you expect of them. So example, like I had said, kids can get really flooded when they have the expectation that you put a food in front of them they don't like and they, oh, they get really upset. But when you like calm them down and you're able to say like, look, I'm just like, just touch it, you know, this is what you have to do. And then it really helps them understand like, oh, okay, like I can do that. Like I don't have to eat it. Um, and so really, especially at the beginning when you're doing it and you're trying to really model all of the different kind of hierarchical steps, it's really good to model it, um, to just show them what they need to do. Shaping, this is probably the most common one um, that we use uh, for teaching um, kids to explore and be exposed them to foods is the closer and closer approximations of the desired behavior. So like I've been saying, it's like touching, licking, smelling, putting in your mouth. These are closer and closer approximations and a child gets a little bit more familiar, a little bit more familiar to be able to actually try and eat it. Um, we know that it takes about 10 times for a child to, or actually anybody to try a food and feel like they can make a really good decision about whether they like it or not, especially a child who has a very restrictive palate and they haven't been exposed to some of those things. Your palate can really change. If you like, say you, you restricted sugar from your diet, um, things would taste super sugary even after like seven days. So a child needs some time to kind of, as they're exposed to these different things, they're gonna be more um, intense of a, of a sensory experience. Um, and so that slow exposure really helps them. So, you know, we have what we call slow exposure, which is kind of like this picture where you're slowly just kind of putting your feet in the water and then you get used to that feeling. And then it, you, it's a little bit easier to take over time versus flooding, which would be this picture where they're just getting hit by that wave super hard. And, um, and it becomes very, it can be very shocking. Um, there is, and you should know, in some behavioral um, strategies that are uses are used, escape extinction is a common one. Um, and in contrast to the slow exposure, I'm a much bigger fan of the slow exposure because I think kids may be and parents um, really kind of um, take to it a little bit more, and the the extinction can be a little bit more um, intense and. Uh, but both are effective. And sometimes, unfortunately, you might have to use this strategy, um, especially in the inpatient unit when the kid's really at a, at, in a dire strait. So you want to make sure to assess the level of discomfort, just like I said, with that chocolate scale after each exposure, because you can never go too slow, um, but you can always go too fast. And if you push your child too quickly, you will lose them and they'll become very dysregulated. So it's worth it to throw in those easier tasks. It's worth it to stay at that level um, before you move on to the next level. Here's an example of like a hierarchy or a step ladder um, that you can look at, but basically we're trying to write all those steps. Some kids might only need five or six steps. Some kids actually might need a 10, you know? And again, like I said, some of the examples will be like, touch, lick, smell, put in your mouth, take it out, take a bite, spit it out. And so you would kind of write all these steps down so that the parent knows exactly what that hierarchy would be. And as a child gets deeper into their ability to try new foods, you might not have to start at the touch stage anymore because they've really overcome trying new foods, but you still might have to start slowly because um, you're really getting into those harder foods. And when you get into those harder foods, you still want to make sure you're doing the easy ones because when it gets too hard, a child will just realize, oh, every time we do this, it's so awful and I don't want to do it anymore. But if you still throw in some of those easy ones, like, ooh, like a new chocolate you haven't tried or um, a new bar that's very similar to what you have, it's like you just throw them an easy one and it helps the process um, and for them to not give up. So here's a little video of an example of a, a parent um, shaping a child's behavior. You wanna try pear? Can you kiss it for a piece of cookie? You wanna kiss it? Yeah. Come here. <laughs> and what I like about this video is that you can see that um, one thing I would not do that the parent did in this video was say, do you wanna try a pear? Instead, I would kind of do what she had said, oh, before, like, oh, you know, you know, the reward here is a cookie and they've decided on that. 
And then she's saying, you know, kiss the pear. And maybe she has another thing on her plate, like yogurt or something. And, and the way I would do it was like, oh, do you want to lick the pear or kiss the, kiss the pear or lick the, I don't know, whatever that is, um, yogurt. And the child gets to choose. The other great thing about this, you see the child kind of roaming. He's coming to the parent. And so we really just want the child to not feel forced. We want the child to come to it and do it versus the parent forcing the child. So I try pair food. Um, the next one is chaining. So we want to change one aspect of the time with the food. So it could just be the color. It could just be the container. It could just be the shape. So again, the shape, like maybe you do a big one or maybe you just do a different color. Like maybe they make like goldfish, but you're just changing the color or the brand or something like that. And in the US and where we are, we have like these goldfish, but we also have these things called like bunny crackers and we have rocket ships and they're all kind of the same type. And so we try to use the shapes like that. Um, what you, in another example is how you would chain from similar to dissimilar is like you would chart, start with the kid's chip and then you would slowly move down the line where you would try a tortilla chip and a hard shell taco, dipping the hard shell taco in, in ground beef ground beef into this, and then eventually the taco. Um, so again, you wanna start with similar and move more towards the dissimilar, and you wanna pair foods that go together. So obviously it's better to be pairing <laughs> a tortilla with ground beef than with something else that doesn't go with it. Um, so now we're gonna get into our consequence-based strategies. Um, so the first one we're gonna talk about is contingent reinforcement. So the response depends upon the child's response and behavior. So if the child engages in the positive behavior, they lick, touch, whatever you had asked them to do, they get the reward. If they do not engage in the positive behavior, they should not get the reward. Um, if the child tends to do more than what you asked, like say it was actually to like put it in your mouth, but the child just like eats it, then I tend to give them a bigger reward um, if they did it. And then again, you wanna provide the reward immediately right after the positive behavior occurs. Consistency is really important um, because we want to be contingent uh, all the time. Um, some of the time just doesn't work. We have to be consistent. Otherwise, the child's going to believe that they can have the reward with actually not earning it, um, or they will continue to do the undesired response. So contingent, re this is an example of contingent reinforcement. Um, and in this, this example, you'll see the, the, the person like withholding the reward because the child didn't do the behavior and then also providing it when it was appropriate. Ready? Chris, you want more or pretzel? You want another pasta for pretzel. Wash it down. Take a bite or give it a kiss. You can give it a kiss. She eats a uh, plain spaghetti noodle or macaroni and cheese, but that's it. So there she's trying to grab it, and the person's like, mm, I don't want to let you have it. You have to do this. She did the behavior, and she gets, she gets the reward of the pretzel. Extinction is the last one in terms of uh, consequence-based strategy. So this comes back to the contingency as extinction means the behavior no longer gets the response. So for example, let's say grabbing happened and it was getting worse. She was like really grabbing it, coming after the person. And then the person just couldn't take it anymore. And she gave in here. Well, this graph shows you how much a behavior tends to have to happen. So it'll peak, it'll get worse, it'll get worse. And then it will start to come down. So if that person had reinforced her here when she was grabbing it and getting really physical, um, then what would happen is the next time this happens, the behavior would have to go much higher. I mean, she might be get more aggressive and more intense before it would kind of come down. So it's really important to wait that behavior out um, because it will drop at some point. It just can't maintain, but you really can't give in um, here. Otherwise it will make it a lot worse. So you wanna wait that behavior out until it has stopped and then remind the child of their choices and possible reward. So different uh, evidence-based practices out there um, feeding approach wise, we have two that we're, I'm gonna briefly go over. One is the autism meal plan. And here's an example of the different um, practices that they do. So for example, things like ways to increase appropriate behavior, way to increase communication. Um, here's also self-feeding um, skills, introducing new foods. And this was a program that was developed uh, for three to eight-year-olds that have autism. It's parent training curriculum, it's eight sessions, and there was one hour um, 
they were one hour group sessions. Um, Another one that's been used is the buffet program, which is building up food flexibility and exposure. This is that CBT type model. Um, this was used more for a little bit older kids, which was eight to 12 year olds that had autism. Um, they had a selective feeding issues and it was a 14 week multifamily group program. Um, so for example, the kids modules would be working on like their anxiety, coping strategies, reframing, flexibility, taste and sensory type training. And then the parent training would employ some of the things that we talked about, like modeling, role-playing, generalization, psychoeducation, how to use reinforcements. Um, and similar to what we had talked about before, some of these goals of increased food flexibility, which lead to the larger food repertoire. And here's a little example of you know, what they used in their program. So here they used forks, like I gave the example of the like chocolates, but this would probably be like a food rating. Um, this would be kind of reframing thoughts, like one from like what we call a faux thought to a more friendly thought that carrots are vegetables and I don't like them is maybe the thought they're having and trying to reframe it to maybe I can take them. Not all vegetables are the same. And they also do things like trying to get the child to um, rate the flavor and the texture and whatnot. So resources for feeding uh, and eating issues and autism. These are the websites that you can look at. Um, one's called Feeding Matters, and I, I believe it's just feedingmatters.org. Eating Disorders in Victoria just, um, gives an example of like anorexia and some of the comorbid issues and understanding eating disorders in autism. Autism Speaks as a free uh, feeding guide uh, for behavior in children with autism. If you just Google Autism Speaks feeding guide, you'll be able to find it, download it. The Marcus Autism Center is really well known in the US for feeding, um, feeding therapy and feeding treatment. And they have a lot of good resources on that website. The book that I had mentioned earlier about food chaining is by Sherry Fraker. Um, and the articles where you can find more about the two programs I just talked about um, are the, if you, if you look up Autism Meal Plan and the Buffet Program, um, you can read a little bit more about them. Another up and coming treatment that um, hasn't been tested in kids on the spectrum, but I think could be also effective, although there, there's research to support for ARFID, but again, we haven't tested it in kids on the spectrum, is space for ARFID, where it really works on um, some behavioral components and the exposure, but it also kind of addresses the anxiety around it um, and the rigidity. Uh, individualized reinforcers and hierarchical exposures, if you Google that, you'll find a paper that was similar to the um, step ladder I had. I had showed you in, earlier in the slides. And that's it. So uh, I think now we're going to take questions and um, information. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Berquist, uh, for this comprehensive and informative lecture. I know a lot of uh, people have been asking about uh, topic related to feeding, so I'm glad that uh, we were able to finally deliver on uh, this request. So we'll go over a little bit the questions. And as you would expect, we have a quite a bit of questions. So, yeah. Um, so the first question is, how do I encourage my child, my child to try new foods? Um, but here, something specific about this child who is a seven year old and refused to eat food with sauce, but likes ketchup, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, any thoughts how to uh, use that uh, uh, preference to increase? Yeah. I'm actually glad that person mentioned because I the first time I kind of practiced this talk, I had mentioned it and I and I forgot to do it here. Sauce is such a gateway sauce, dipping, anything where you can pair it and it's going to make it taste better because it's kind of goes back to that pairing issue or chaining issue where you could even like drench the potato, like a teeny tiny piece of potato, like in ketchup. And it basically just tastes like ketchup. Um, and you're licking and when you're licking, you're licking ketchup. Um, and I would also kind of, depending on what it is, I would be looking at what kind of textures your child already eats. I still would take a really slow approach where I would be 
um, starting with the really easy behaviors of licking and smelling and touching and all of that, or putting it in their mouth and spitting it out. But you want to make sure that whatever you pair with the dip, like goes with the food item, right? So if you're going to do ketchup, you want to make sure it's a food that really goes with that particular item um, and try to start there. Um, so for example, I have a lot of kids that come in and it's like, you know, cheese is their number one thing or chocolate. Chocolate's like my number one thing that kids love to do. And so it's like really pairing chocolate as much as possible. And you'd be surprised how many things that you could pair with chocolate. <laughs> it does taste good or like fruit. And like, you know, we know we have some meals that like have a chocolate sauce and now we have like chocolate hummus and chocolate yogurt and everything. And so like, that's a way where, um, if we can get that flavor, then the child will be more accepted to it because it's so familiar. And so, for example, maybe I will, again, like drench the thing in ketchup and then slowly fade back uh, um, the amount of ketchup that's on the item so that the child then eventually gets used to how the texture tastes without the ketchup and then maybe eventually will accept that item. Very good. Thank you. Um, next question. How do you feel, uh, how do you help children who lack a sense of uh, feeling hungry or full? Not only one, but worse, which means yeah, that they eat yeah. too little or too much. Yeah, I mean, again, I think, you know, it comes back to that assessment issue. Like, first, I would want to make sure we rule out any medical issues about the fullness. We do know that there are some disorders where the child really does struggle um, with feeling full and you're really not getting some of that natural dopamine release when you, you eat, um, you know, some kids, depending on what it is, like if they have other issues, sometimes I send them to Dr. Harden and we talk about appetite stimulants or what medications they're on that actually help facilitate the appetite. Cause I have had kids that, um, they're actually on a medication, but if they like were able to switch the medication, um, we would actually get a better bang for our buck in terms of the child's willingness to want to eat because it's making them like more hungry. Um, when it comes to the fullness, again, the other issue is, um, so to me, it's also about qu quantity, quality versus quantity. So even if I'm just doing a little bit, but I'm rewarding there, like it's a very like sailing an item, at first I would probably start with those little ones just to get the ball rolling. Um, but I definitely wanna be checking out the, the medical issues. Um, it is definitely a harder one if you, if you aren't able to figure out the medical issues, to be honest, um, because then it really relies on um, your ability to find a different kind of reinforcer um, when it's so difficult. Very good. Something also to think about is that kids in general and also kids with autism, their self-perception about some physiologic and some sensory yeah. related things is a little bit off. And that's why they cannot modulate uh, yeah. some sensory and they cannot perceive right. uh, with accuracy right. whether they are hungry or full or full. Yeah. I mean, it's, the other point to that is, um, you know, I kind of equate it similarly to some kids that have issues with understanding when they have to use the restroom and whatnot. And so what we tend to do is put them on that schedule. So when we put them on a schedule, their body will tend to have those cues and we might just have to put them on a regular schedule to eat. And, um, and that can be an effective way is that one, you kind of pair it um, consistently with the same time, the same time every day, um, you can do what we call a habit training, um, which we do with restroom use. And we also do with feeding um, if we have that issue. Um, and, and I think that's what the structure is there for too. We want to make sure kids aren't grazing and we want to make sure that that's also not the reason they're feeling um, not having the like pains of hunger or whatnot um, is that they really understanding, you know, their body and we have to maybe retrain it a little bit by structuring it. Very good. Thank you. Before mm -hmm. I move to the next question, I want to thank Dana for translating uh, the different questions. And uh, Dana, it will be great if you can revise the first question or look at again at the first question because it doesn't seem to be clear to me. Very good. The next one is, <laughs> again, how to diversify the child menu or repertoire 
And in this situation, the child eats pasta. So <laughs> what kind of creative approaches you can recommend with regard to make things things or including pasta in the menu? Yeah, it's a common one. Um, I think it depends on, to be honest, if the kid is really averse to like, it, again, it would depend on the kid, but if they're really averse to trying like anything new, I would actually like really branch out on even the pasta area, meaning I would try like the different shapes and I would try to, um, you know, maybe probably start there. Then what I would probably do is, are we adding things to their pasta? You know, if they like the butter versus, or the olive oil, you know, that's actually another great way to get calorie intake is kind of adding different elements that might not make it taste like too different. Um, but maybe I would slowly add little, little different things where like, maybe it's, I take a small set of the pasta and I have the cheese and then maybe I add a little bit of hamburger meat or again, I'm, or I, I shave in a little bit of broccoli, but it's not enough that it would really like impact the taste. And then the child gets used to the color and the little bits, right. Cause they, they don't like the little bits. Yeah. Um, I also do the same thing with pizza where I'm like trying to slowly shape it. Right. Um, it might be that they try a little bit of the pasta sauce. Like if they like tomato ketchup, then we know they're probably going to be okay with tomato sauce. And I want to get variety there. We also know pasta has a lot of different kinds of flavors. You could do the like Alfredo, you could do the Parmesan, you could do, and that's another way to do it. And so I kind of like slowly expand from there. If I wanted to get creative as I chain out, we do know that there are alternatives to pasta, like spaghetti, um, spaghetti, what is it called? Squ spaghetti squash and zucchini and now we can use these like more starchy kind of vegetables that give that similar flavor to pasta um and it's not exactly the same um in america now we have like all these different kinds we have like we also have um things like chickpea pasta and so sometimes i do that or whole wheat or the color you know and sometimes that's a, that's a really great way to introduce color like actually even using food dye and dyeing the color of the pasta, it's not going to change the flavor, but a child could break color that way too. And so you could even put like the little dots of green in there and that kind of resembles the like the vegetables. And then eventually you, you branch out to actually putting vegetables in them. Again, there's certain vegetables that aren't going to change it too much. Like jicama doesn't taste like much. And you know, there's some root vegetables that again are, are kind of similar. So I think you can get creative if you can slice it a certain way and yeah. um yeah Some, something also to add to what dr burgers mentioned there is the uh, the introducing the the child uh, not only to the taste of having something different but to the idea so anyway if you start with very 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 minimal additional stuff then mm -hmm. the, the child will be less anxious Yes. To consider something. So it's the idea, not actually the taste. Yeah. So I have kids. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you brought up like a good example is color, right? And yeah. I have a kid that, or I've had some kids where it's like, they won't eat the different colored goldfish. It's not the same. And this kid was willing. And I did like a blind, like blind taste test. And I'm like, tell me what color it is. And he told me the wrong color. I was like, no, it was the green one. He's like, oh what and like from that day forward he just ate the green after that because he was like well you know he's the best expert on that and so I think definitely that's a, a way to do it is just the idea and you know a lot of parents will come in and they will say I want my kid to eat vegetables and meat and all that stuff and I'm like that is my goal too I hear you we will not get there unless the kid can eat like one shade different, right? If they're a kid that's like, I want it on five, you know, and if it's on three, I'm not going to eat it. You know, we have to like one step forward, right? Like we have to take those little steps to get to those bigger steps. And so one of the things I tell the parents that I work with in America, we have this place called Vegas, which I don't know if you guys have heard of, but it's the place where we gamble and spend money and all this stuff. And I'll tell parents like, all right, if you had to bet a bunch of money at Vegas, what would you bet it on? Like what food that you could put in front of your kid that if they actually ate it, actually tasted it, they would love it. And that helps them understand like where we have to start and where we're going to get to. Very good. Thank you. Next question. Um, 
how to discourage a child from eating while watching TV, specifically cartoons? And interestingly, uh, in the situation, the child used to be interested in commercials and now switch to cartoons. Oh, it's actually a good thing. But um, <laughs> and, um, so typically what I would say is that if it's preferred food already, then what I would say is like take a bite and then alter on the cartoons. So we would want to make sure the child's present at least for each bite. And then maybe I would increase like um, let them have a certain amount. And then eventually I would be like, now you have to take two bites or three bites and we'd work up to then the entire meal. And then the child would be able to watch the video. But again, that's like a, that would be a huge switch if you're just like, no more TV, you're going to watch TV. But if we kind of tried it to find a way to say like, look, you're going to get the TV. You just got to eat this thing that you already eat. So if you're going to work towards getting off a device, I would start with only the foods the child already eats and is accepting and slowly work on fading the presence of the TV until after the meal time. And you would do that slowly, just like you would do the other things so that they go, okay, I trust you. You're going to give it to me. I just have to do this thing. Very good. Um, you know, it's kind of the same recurring themes, but uh, it will be good to pick your brain. Um, um, you know, how to teach a slide to eat uh, solid food. The child in this situation uh, avoids to chew hard things and uh, chewing gum. Well, chewing gum is quite challenging. So we tend to actually try to pick the foods, like if a child's really struggling with the transition from liquids or um, really soft foods to solid foods, that is kind of where some feeding disorders will start. Um, what we want to try to look at is what's the flavor of what they're already eating. Is there a way to make what they're already eating a little bit more solid? Right. So like if it's like, say, a yogurt or something, could we make could we freeze it and it's a little bit harder. And so it's still soft to chew, but it's a little bit more of a substantial kind of texture. The other thing that we do um, is to have, you know, when when even if the child's older, we would look at some of those early eating, teething kind of foods that are much more easy to eat for young children who maybe don't have teeth. Right. Like the teethers or the they have these dissolvable yogurt things. Um, things that we could encourage the chewing, but that they would still like dissolve or easily break up in the mouth. The other thing I would look at is what are the flavors the child eats and is there anything that's kind of associated? But again, it's the same type of thing where we're trying to start with just a little bit of a differentiation and move up to those harder, more crunchier foods um, or the foods that are a little bit more like Meat can be really tricky because of the texture and the type of meat that you're eating. So often with meat, you have to start with maybe the ground meat because that one's just a little bit easier to chew versus like obviously a tough steak <laughs> really tricky um, or even a burger, right? If, if we have to put in the effort to chew it, then we want to start a little by little. The other thing that I have done with kids that have some of that chewing issue is we start with very, very, very tiny bites. So again, that like they get used to the feeling in their mouth, kind of like used to the idea. And they, but if they actually swallowed it, they'd be okay. They wouldn't choke. We wouldn't have problems. And then eventually you try to do again, like just, you know, tap, tap, and then they can swallow it. So it's, again, it's kind of like trying to build up that idea and that ability to be like, I'm okay with this texture being my mouth. And some of it too might just be that they hold the texture in their mouth and they spit it out. So there's there's a lot of different ways to go about it. it just depends on what the kid's actually eating. Um, but again, like slowly shaping it to a harder form, because even if it's kind of like even more icy or more hard, you can get a little bit of some sort of resistance on the teeth where they'd have to practice that. Very good. Thank you. I think mm -hmm. you touched on the next question, which is regarding to meat and eating meat. But here in this situation, uh, the challenge is the smell yeah the smell sensitivity to meat i don't know if you have any yeah and i think i think it's tricky like i i think there have been some kids where we've been able to work through some of the smell um, but some smells are really pungent like certain fishes and um certain meats some kids can get used to it when they're exposed to it. Um, or maybe we do need to give them a little bit of a, you know, a plug while they're eating it and then slowly kind of, you know, let it out. Um, I tend to, when I do meat, it depends on the kid and what their textures are like. 
sometimes I start with something really hard like bacon or jerky because that's a little bit, especially if they eat crunchy foods, it smells a little bit less pungent and um, it's easier to eat. So sometimes I start with like a gateway, like if they eat pizza, it's putting in like a small bit. So maybe the pizza smell kind of overrides that tiny little piece of meat. Um, you, if smell is an issue, I would again, start with like the blander types and move up. Obviously like a lot of kids like the, and this is common in young kids, like the breaded kind of foods. And so I tend to start with the breaded types of foods and then slowly peel the breaded part off so that then they get used to eating. Like I've had kids where they only eat like McDonald's nuggets and then eventually get to different kinds of nuggets. And then we get to a breaded filet and then we get to a grilled filet of, of chicken. So there are also those kinds of ways to do it. I think the smell like, again, I think fish is really tricky. Um, I don't blame them. Um, so, you know, I, I did have a kid who like, was desensitized to tuna. We didn't ask him to eat it, but at least he could be in the room if somebody was eating it like far away. But sometimes I will I'll say, you know what? I get it. It's too stinky. Like, but if you can eat other meats and we kind of work on other stuff, like I'm okay with that. Like I actually really don't like salmon. I've tried it so many times, like under the sun, like every different way. And I just don't like it. And there are just going to be some foods that are like that. And so um, I think that's okay. You know, there are certain ones that we're not going to push. And so if a child is like the one night you cook fish and it's super stinky, like let them be in the other room for that one. Don't, don't worry about that. Very good. Thank you. I'm mindful mm -hmm. of the time. So we'll try to answer questions that are a little bit different. I still see some questions that are, uh, that I am sure that we've covered either in the presentation or in the Q and A. So that's why I'm gonna try to get to some questions that are a little bit different. Um, for kids who are hesitant uh, to try anything new, what kind of strategy do you have to allow them to facilitate that they take medication, especially in emergency situations? Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes I have had to prioritize medications over food um, just because of what's going on. Um, and I think it depends. Like, where you're at and what's available to you, right? So if obviously a liquid form is available, um, if a chewable is available, if like what it is that you have to do. Um, so like for Pediasure, I'll give an example of a liquid. Um, we have like the chocolate, we have the vanilla, and then we have like a fruit kind. And so maybe I would try to find the one that the kid's more related to when I, maybe I dilute it or maybe I'll add it with another liquid. Some kids um, really don't like the taste of Pediasure. And so I'd have to titrate it with the milk. So that's another kind of like a chaining or shaping kind of process where maybe it's like one tiny part Pediasure and the rest is milk. And then I'm kind of going, same thing for the opposite way. If I'm trying to get it off Pediasure and onto milk, I would do it the same way. Whereas I would start with a little, very little so that the taste is not so overwhelming. In terms of like swallowing pills, that one's a little bit trickier um, depending on the child's age. I have used like tiny baby M&Ms or Tic Tacs or things that might resemble the size of the, um, the medicine. And I would first start with those that are like highly rewarding and the child gets used to it. And then they're basically able to just, you know, put it back or find a way to kind of swallow it so that they're not gagging and throwing up. And I don't care if they take it or not, because it's not medicine. You really want to start with something that's either like much smaller than the medicine that you have to take um, or um, and, and not go like too much to a bigger size. Right. The other thing is if it's a multivitamin, obviously, um, you know, that can be in a different thing. Sometimes people ground them up if they can be in, in, put into the item. Iron is a, probably the hardest one because iron, um, if you take dairy with iron, you, it doesn't work. And to help iron actually be effective, you should be taking vitamin C or some sort of like, um, like, uh, like orange juice or something like that. So iron is, is probably the hardest one that I've had to deal with in terms of like a vitamin or a mineral. And I think you just have to get creative and we have to do our best to try to find ways to um, put it in there. Um, and, and again, it's always thinking about what's similar that maybe the child would be able to do. 
what are the skills the child needs? Is it swallowing? Is it chewing? Is it accepting a liquid? And if possible, depending on the medication and depending on what it is, is it okay to smart with a smaller amount and work up to a bigger amount, whether that's liquid or a chewable or, um, uh, or liquid, I think. So no. Very good. Okay. Um, last question. I know there are many more questions uh, <laughs> here. Uh, uh, so kids who uh, you'd expect, picky eaters and parents would like to take them to a restaurant, but the restaurant you have issues there with sensories regarding loud noises, a lot of people. What should you prioritize? Food diversity or getting to a restaurant? You know, I think it's up to the parents. Um, so what they prefer. I, if it were me, I think I would think about there's a lot of different aspects to that. So if it's that like, you know what, I want my family to go to a restaurant and, um, but maybe I'm not gonna worry about the food. So I'm gonna focus on the sensory and I'm gonna think about where can I sit that my child might be okay with? It's better to sit outside. Is it better to sit in a corner? Does my child need headphones? Do they need a device to help them? Because what I care about more is getting out of the house, which is totally reasonable, right? When you're struggling and you wanna be able to be social and whatnot. Um, and that might be what you need to do in the interim before you work on the foods. Then what I would do, and I have had kids where I would figure out what the appetizers are on the menu and I would figure out, is there anything close to what the kid eats? Anything close to the kinds of places that you go to, right? And um, so for one kid, it was like eating the chips or eating the bread or, you know, um, and you can pretty much get some type of bread at like any kind of restaurant you know, or some kind of starchy kind of food. And maybe I would start with bringing that food home and I would start to work on getting them to accept of that food or a similar type of food so that when they see it at the restaurant, they'd be able to accept it more. So um, so that's one way to do, or working on, one of the goals I had with one of my kids was trying to find one thing from each genre. So he, he was a bit older and so he didn't have to miss out on going to social events with his friends. So he'd, he'd at least have something at every type of restaurant that he would be able to eat or order. So he felt like he could participate. So to me, it, I think you have to see it as it might not be their full like um, menu, uh, but the child can participate and maybe you could work toward it. My goal is always to get to a child to be able to at least eat some of the things that the family eats and potentially all the things that the family eats, but it's a tall order. And so then I would work towards that. And then I would also work towards it in those kinds of restaurants. Something else to keep in mind is that what you could do is bring food with you if you want to practice. Yeah, do that too. I have a lot of families that do that as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's also common for young kids, right? Like yeah. you're bringing some of their foods because they're, the child might not eat as much. And so, um, but maybe you'll still like present some of those foods. But yeah, absolutely. You could you could bring some of their food as well if, if the restaurant's okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I um, I meant to answer online uh, uh, about the question about the 15 year old uh, with different uh, uh, psychopathology between anorexia, OCD, and bulimia with regard to the best professional here. Usually, we recommend having an evaluation in the eating disorder with somebody eating disorder just to make sure that the child is safe because sometimes anorexia can lead to significant hemodynamic yeah. issues. Well, the other issue is that the, the treatments that are typically used for kids on the spectrum, or sorry, for those who have eating disorders need to be modified for kids on the spectrum. And a lot of people miss the autism um, because they don't realize and it presents a little bit differently, okay. but it always has to be modified because it, it's very different than how it presents and the treatment actually will fail or be more traumatic to the individual. And so we really need to be thinking about that and it needs to be explicit that this kid is on the, has autism and we need to have a little bit of, you know, differentiation for them. Very good. Uh, thank you. I want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Dr. Burquist, for this great lecture. And I want to thank uh, Irena, Dimitri, Dana uh, for helping us out. Uh, and this presentation or this webinar will be available shortly on uh, line thank you everyone and we'll see you next thank time you. which will be the first uh, of february have a good rest yeah. of the day and the week
Very good. Thank All right, you again, take care. Dr. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. -bye.